Good afternoon and welcome to this, our first BSI Built Environment webinar of 2023. For those of us that have not met before, my name is Anne Bird and I'm Head of Built Environment at BSI and I'll be your host for today. Now, we have something a little bit different for you today. We have no external guest speakers, but rather I will be joined by my BSI Built Environment Sector team colleagues and we'll be taking you through our role in BSI and what we will be doing in 2023 to support our sector. But first, a bit of housekeeping, if I may. Um, we've been very fortunate to have much of your time before, so you're probably aware of much of this. But just to recap, this is a listen-only webinar that is being recorded. We really, really do welcome your questions via the Q&A function off to the side. Um, we've already got a number of questions that were pre-submitted, but we'd love to hear some more from you as we go forward. What we've got for you today is we'll run through our, our slide presentation and then we will have a Q&A session at the conclusion therein. But if you do want to submit any questions, just hit that Q&A button and post your question. We really welcome it. If you do have any uh, experience, any technical difficulties, please submit your issue also via the Q&A function and the back of house team uh, who do an amazing job will get you sorted and back on track. And as per normal with our, our events and webinars, upon completion of the feedback survey, we will send you a link to the recording of the webinar um, and a copy of the slides that we go through today. Okay, let's get started. So in terms of who will be joining me today, a fine collection of people they are. Obviously, I've introduced myself and Bird, Head of Built Environment at BSI. I've got a locus of building regulations, health, safety, welfare, et cetera, fire safety background. So I'll be covering some of that today. We'll be joined by Dan, Dan Rossiter, who's our sector lead for all things digital. We'll be joined by Claire, sector lead for sustainability, professional competency, MMC, and so the list goes on. She runs the show, basically. And we'll also be joined by sector lead Polly colleague Ian Richardson, who covers off construction products and quality management. But first to begin, and perhaps a bit of a, a gentle reminder, um, BSI was formed back in 1901, and we were the world's first national standards body. It was some time after the formation of the World Trade Organization that they then decided that all countries should have a national standard body. And of course, you BSI was the UK's national standard body, your national standard body. We have an MOU with His Majesty's Government and we have a Royal Charter. And it is worthwhile just reminding ourselves as to what the Charter sets out and the agreement that we have within our memorandum with government. The primary intent is to coordinate the efforts of companies and persons for the improvement, standardization and simplification of materials products and processes, and of systems for the management of business, safety, technology, services, and the environment. So it's pretty all consuming. BSI is actually a very large group. There are some 5,000 employees, but myself and my team that I've introduced to you, we sit within the knowledge part of BSI group. So the National Standards Body Knowledge Solutions Standards Arena, okay? The much larger part of the BSI group involves consulting, voluntary certification and testing, and mandatory certification, okay, for things like medical devices and construction products. But we're in the, in the, the far left blue box, and between us and our colleagues, we have a code of conduct, because as the National Standards Body, we serve all of the marketplace. We do work closely with our colleagues in the wider part of BSI, but they are but one provider in our, in our business within our industry. We are um, a non-profit distributing company and we do not have any shareholders. Again, I should imagine for some hundred people we've got on the call today, you'll be more than aware of this, but it is worth just a gentle reminder of what are standards. From our perspective, standards are consensus tools that support companies and people to build trust and improve performance through 
specifications, codes, norms, guidance, and frameworks. Standards do bring competitive advantage and bottom line performance improvement. They are typically voluntary, and where they are utilized, some 10% are perhaps named in regulation, and a percentage thereafter might have status conveyed upon them, such as in the approved documents, where regulators after consultation decide they wish to refer to them as one way of showing compliance. But typically our content is voluntary. If you hark back to where we began, it all began in 1901 with products. It was, it was, it was uh, rolling stock, uh, steel gauges, the tram tracks, railway tracks, and you know, rolled steel joists. That's where standardization started. As we moved into the 50s and beyond, we got into standards that dealt with process, and then moved into actually to potential and business potential, improving business potential, such things as management standards, et cetera. But typically for the built environment, we're looking at briefings, specifications, methods of test, classification, terminology, and codes of practice. They really are our bread and butter. So when we talk about the built environment sector team, how does that fit within the knowledge part of BSI? So we were formed some three and a half years ago, and we work closely with the policy team, which is headed up by our Director General of Standards, Dr. Scott Steedman. He oversees engagement across the UK, but also our relationship with regional and international standards bodies. We work very closely with our committee team, our all important committee team, who service and support and oversee our all important committees. We've got about 100 committees uh, within the built environment and about 4,000 technical experts, some of you who are probably actually on this call, who give their time and or their employers' time to help us develop uh, content and standards. We also work closely with content development to help us write and edit our standards and products. And of course, we have a services team which undertakes outreach such as international projects, but also if there's a desire for people to sponsor PASs or plate standards or similar. So we sit right in the middle of that and our role is very much to take a strategic leadership of the sector and use our insight and contacts and channel our expertise to help shape and position standards, products and services that ultimately UK stakeholders and beyond need. So first and foremost, we're there to support our industry, government and other internal and external stakeholders. We're a point of contact. And so if you need assistance, then we are here to assist. We obviously work very uh, closely with our strategic sector committees and advisory groups. As I say, we're very lucky in built environment. We have a very vertical alignment of our all important committees, but we have two top committees, CB0 overseeing the built environment and FSH0 overseeing fire safety, okay? A very important committee, and we have a number of advisory committees beneath that where we, we, we work closely with our, our experts there. We help to establish strategic UK and international partnerships because that's key to us. It's key to yourselves as well, because where we have recognition of the development of of standards and products that have been developed by UK expertise, which is recognized abroad, that can act as a springboard to UK products and services. And you know, that continues to this day, such areas as the Far East and the Middle East as, as some recent examples. Yet we're there to build and maintain the BSI brand, of course we are, but we are there to serve. And it's our duty to understand current and future market drivers in key industry sectors, and communicate that in and around BSI so we know our colleagues are fully appraised. We had seven sector teams, built environment, that's us talking today. We have a digital team that looks at advanced manufacturing and telco, energy, ESG, food, healthcare, and a very busy transport and mobility team as well. But let's put it into context for the built environment sector. So from our perspective, where we sit, the built environment is defined as a collection of man-made or induced physical objects in a particular area or region. It's as simple as that and as inclusive as that. Built environment sits, as I say, along with the other sector teams, but we do touch a number of those teams. So sustainability is a horizontal that passes across all of the sectors. Um, energy and, and sustainability is also one that passes in a horizontal provision across all of us. But we also work closely with healthcare because of healthcare buildings and similar, 
but also work very closely with transport and mobility because whilst they might be dealing with vehicles and roadway and rail we'll be invariably dealing with transport infrastructure buildings and so we have those touch points when we look at the built environment sector it's worth reminding ourselves just the size of the market from a uk perspective and this is latest figures from uh, the construction playbook for recollection it's a worth of about 180 billion pounds it's about six percent of gdp at any one time it employs somewhere between two and a half and three million people yes if you put it into the context of internationally the money spent on design and construction is nine trillion but design and construction is 180 billion for the uk if you then add in fm facilities and assets management that's about 47 billion in the uk but that includes utility bills and similar so it's more than just the process it is also the billing associated with the fm market and so it's a very sizable piece of activity and truly important typically and you'll know this as construction professionals you tend to look at design and construction costing about 20 percent of the total totex cost of running a building designing a building and running a building 80 percent on maintaining it as a subset of that as an industry if we look at construction products we've got a very big footprint uk that's worth about 63 billion but in the world marketplace yeah that's getting close to three quarters of a trillion uh, pounds but we are a sizable player and we're very important to the uk in terms of thinking about it in the world stage yes of course usa and china account for some 37 percent of the global market yes we're two percent but we're a very important two percent then you need to look at the effects that we bring about. 30% of global energy related carbon emissions are attributed to buildings. We are part of the problem and therefore we need to be part of the solution. 40% of global energy related emissions, when you take that 30% of operational carbon and add in embedded and embodied carbon in materials and the construction process, 40% come from the built environment in terms of global, in terms of our carbon emissions. That's a huge, huge part of a solution that needs to be found. We are, yes, typically a highly regulated sector, but I think if we go back not too far, some five and a half years now, we'll see that perhaps compliance is somewhat wanting. In terms of major areas of UK investment, these are very important to us, the BSI and standardization process. Down the left hand side there you've got some uk major construction programs the likes of high speed 2 tideway and similar they're really important for us because they're great users of standards and they're great testers of standards and when they feel that they need further innovation and development we with our experts with our committees we can work with them to develop standards that they need to move forward with their construction programs and ultimately they feed back in and we all benefit at a standards level and they're made available across our portfolio. Similarly, Innovate UK research programs are quite sizable too, and this is where we can develop some funding and secure some funding to allow us to innovate and develop more standards and content for use by the industry. We've got the catapults, we've got CIH, yes, that's been a completely but in legacy mode, same as active building, but they're still hugely important entities that allow us to maintain and uh, obtain some, uh, some funding and develop our portfolio and content needs for our stakeholders that's why we're always keen to support the delivery or the legacy of major infrastructure projects it's hugely important to us um, the other thing to say is i'll put it into the just the, the root of sort of the international context we're aware of some very large work underway across the globe you've only got to look to the likes of the middle east with some of their giga cities such as neon half of 500 billion dollars that one again you know, some of those marketplaces utilize international standards, American standards and similar. If we can assist with that, and it's right for them as a region that they want to use some of our content, some of our, our insight, again, that could be a really powerful springboard for UK PLC products and services. In terms of construction output, if we go back to that original 80 billion, just to put that in context, that's a similar size to the healthcare sector in the UK. There's a breakdown of where the output comes from. Obviously, private housing is quite sizable. Commercial, less so of late, post-COVID, people are changing their needs around commercial, certainly office space. 
Um, but if we come back to the green sort of sector in a moment, infrastructure has always been important, about 40% of our output, and you know, public non-housing and to a lesser extent, public housing and industrial. But if you come back to the green sector, what's really key is that's the importance of the repair and maintenance of our building stock, including domestically some 27 million homes. And those are the areas where we need to focus in on things like energy efficiency retrofit. So a hugely important part of the marketplace and an area which we do provide content and support into, but no doubt it will need more. So when we put it into the context of trends and challenges, risks, and ultimately opportunities for our stakeholders, you know, a, a simple way to look at it might be the sort of almost clock face before you. Starting at around one o'clock, we know we've been affected by the whole issue of profitability. Unfortunately, we have seen tier one contractors and entities fall because of margins being so low, and that continues to be an issue. From a product manufacturer's perspective, raw materials are expensive. We saw two, at least two hits of price rises last year. So we know that's an issue that we need to think about to see if we as BSI can help in terms of providing guidance in terms of how best to procure and what good practice might look like. If we move around to sustainability, my background is building rigs. I was a district surveyor at the start of my career. You know, we didn't have to go back but we saw that energy efficiency in buildings have been in the building regs since the 1970s. They weren't there for carbon, they were there for cost savings and to deal with the then oil crisis. But now, when you see the numbers that I quoted at the start, the impact of the built environment, sustainability rightfully is front and centre of, of BSI's thoughts and its expert committee members as to where we go next. Claire will touch upon the work we continue around PADS 2035 and 2030 over domestic retrofit and 2038 for commercial retrofit. But we're now entering the realm of low carbon materials, such as carbon and, and, and so, uh, such as, sorry, steel and cement. But also we've got a couple of activities underway where we want to take active consideration of climate science in the development of all new and revised international standards. Something that was agreed and called the London Declaration uh, not too long ago. And that's something we're looking at. Quality, yeah. We've got an ongoing issue with design versus as built matters. And you know we've got some poor reputation in the marketplace for certain aspects of the built environment. That's why we've developed workmanship standards like the 8000 series and a new standard looking at post occupancy review. Products, yeah, there's a lot going on in the product space. We're awaiting government to come forward with its policy proposals on, on safety critical products. We're also mindful too that we're waiting for some pretty high profile um, recommendations to follow the, the Grand Valley Inquiry. So test methods and classification approaches are all important. BSI actually, in response to the original Dame Judy Hackett review, developed a BSI identifier product, which allows you to provide a unique and persistent identification to construction products that can follow from both its digital perspective all the way through to its inclusion on the product for inclusion site. And there's another example of what we've done to hopefully better support the marketplace. Oh, skills shortage, you know, we're having a lot of people leave the marketplace. Um, Brexit has not assisted that either. So we're having to think more laterally about new types of accessible standards. People aren't going to sit there and look at 200 pages of content from, from BSI if they want more immediate guidance uh, on what to do now. And include in installation guidance and that's something again that we can hang off the product that I refer to as BSI identify. Brexit still remains an issue not least because of UKCA markings that's recently extended the ability to keep using CE marking for another two and a half years but we've got the issue of designated standards and safety critical product standards and we need to see where that goes. Competency again emanated from the tragedy that is Grenfell when the lid was lifted, there was concern about the capability and competency of many in our industry. And so working with the regulator, working with industry, we've developed a suite of competency standards with hopefully more to follow to show what good looks like, what a good competent professional in this industry should have. Digital innovation is definitely one of our sort of uh, great stories and it continues to be, yes, it started with the insight from Bayes and a number of professionals with the advent of the Ever 92 BIM series. That's now been developed and, and, and spun up into ISO, but we've got more to do there in terms of digital twins, in terms of smart building assets, and the beaten band will touch upon that. 
And then if I bring productivity and housing supply together, we've always suffered at the hands of other sectors such as advanced manufacturing. So what can we do to improve productivity and housing supply? And an answer to that is MMC and off-site construction and the benefits it can bring. And we'll touch upon that a bit later as well. So moving along on the slides, if the slides could be knocked on, please. Thank you. Um, just obviously government is hugely important to us, not just central Westminster government, but the devolved administrations too. Just so you perhaps understand how we attempt to serve government and the sector. Government on, on the right hand side there, number of lead government departments, but a number of their actual strategy approaches, including transforming infrastructure, building a safer future, etc. They're feeding from the right. From ourselves, BSI on the left hand side, we tend to couch our approach um, and, and capture it in a way of trust. So, is it trusting data, trusting people, products, services, and the future? The future would be sustainability, for example. And then the touch points that exist between in, in, in the grey uh, connectivity lines there are what we prepare as standards and content, what we work with industry with. To prepare also to support such as the UK BIM framework with the likes of NEMA, the wrapper that goes around BIM, the work we're doing on professional competency to, to, to build upon trust in people and help build a safe future policy to bring trust in products and similar. So that's how we tend to draw this together and actually describe it to people of what we intend to do ourselves and with the all important input from our, our, our experts. And that's just a mere example. We can do that across a myriad of other um, government projects and, and programs. Next slide, please. Dan, over to you. Thank you, Ant, and good afternoon, everyone. So in respect to some of the work we're trying to do around digital, digital is in quite an interesting place at the moment. Um, there's been, as I mentioned, great success around what we've done around BIM and information management. So that's quite a mature area from a standardization point of view where at the moment a lot of the activity is around producing guidance and supporting resources through the likes of NEMA, formerly the UK BIM Alliance and others. And then there are some fairly nascent areas around cyber physical infrastructure, around digital twins and other areas at the moment, which are actually in quite a kind of an early innovative stage, whereby we are sort of limited on what kind of sensible areas of standardization we can do, where focus has been more around concepts and principles, agreeing terminology, so that experts can actually discuss these concepts to then develop up the good practice and stuff that relates to them. So in relation to 2023, the year ahead, what we're really trying to do is continue that promotion of the UK BIM framework, working with people like NEMA, where we co-create the uh, UK BIM Framework Strategy Board and explore opportunities around cyber physical systems and support some of the areas where digital and information management can support. More and more in the industry, there's talk actually not about digital itself, but how digital can support other areas. We saw this with the publication of BS 8644 Part 1 last year, where there's going to be work now looking at actually helping to create the schema that will support that good practice um, through the development of FIRE. Um, there's been conversations recently with people like Zero Construct talking about how can digital support carbon management and some of those areas as well, so similar activities could happen there. We're also cognizant, as you saw on previous slides, of what the IPA are doing with their 10-year TIP roadmap and looking at how we as BSI can help in those situations, as well as more specifically around the golden thread uh, to support the stuff that's coming out of Luke. And as Ant mentioned, this idea of how you actually unambiguously identify products and ensure good access to the information of those products. So we'll continue to promote what we're doing around BSI Identify. That obviously means then we have several key stakeholders we're going to be talking an awful lot to, um, such as NEMA, BASE, and Connected Places Catapults. And there'll be several events that we're focusing on. So I'll be at Digital Construction Week. Hopefully you'll see some nice presentations from me. I'm debating throwing in another one based on Thunderbirds, uh, which seemed to go quite well a couple of years back. And uh, we'll see what other cult classics I can pull out and turn into a presentation. Uh, otherwise, we'll be attending events like the Fire Safety Event, UK Construction Week, and of course our own Global Built Environment Congress at the end of the year. 
So look out for um, lots of content around those areas, as well as things like blogs and webinars that are focusing on the current content we have around digital and how best they can be utilized to support these sort of outcomes as we look to improve some of our existing material like the infographics we have to support the UK BIM framework. And really that's pretty much it for me uh, from a digital point, so I think we could probably focus on our next theme. Next slide please. Thank you Dan. This one's back to me because it covers off health, safety and well-being. Um, from, from our perspective looking into 2023 and what we want and wish to achieve for yourselves is to promote and seek to develop our building safety portfolio. As I said before, we have quite an established portfolio of standards in this space, but they do need from time to time, typically five year amendments, but also as, as recommendations come forward and similar, they need updating. I touched upon earlier the whole issue of the, the competence standards and, and, and the suite of standards that have been developed therein to support recommendations that emanated from Dame Judith Hackett and the needs of the Deluc as a regularly regulator in terms of the advent of the new Build, Building Safety Act. And so we've developed the overarching framework standard for that, which is FLEX 8670, and that will be going out for um, consultation, for, for public consultation shortly, with a view of that being flipped from being a FLEX, a flex standard into a full formal British standard. So watch this space. As part of that, we'll all be updating our competence website, and I'll give you a link for that a bit later, where you can gain access and see all aspects of the competence framework and the vertical competence pieces that sit beneath it in terms of principal contractors uh, and principal designers and those that oversee the maintenance of, of existing buildings. But discussions are also taking place as to other areas and other types of competence standards that we might need that the industry would want that would sit beneath the framework. And that could be including those that actually specify construction products. So to set out a competence approach of you know, who would be suitable to specify such products. We're having discussions as well around the whole issue of whether we need a competence framework to support fire risk assessors. And more generally, what competence is needed at an organizational level as well. So, a lot of activity in the, in the professional competency space. We know our new building safety regulator based uh, within the HSE are looking as well at the competence needs of building control professionals. They're doing that directly themselves. So it's very, very timely um, and very relevant as we move into bringing forward that culture shift that puts safety front and center and moves us out from where we were to the the road to your approach for ensuring that we build truly compliant buildings. So lots in the building safety space. Yes, as I said and touched on already, we can expect this year, we don't know confirmed timings yet, but the Grenfell Inquiry phase two report will be published. I have no doubt that will make recommendations of things that need to be changed and updated. By the same token, we're still awaiting publication of Paul Morell's independent review of construction product testing. That was commenced quite some time ago. It's, there's an awful lot going on at the moment. I recognise that. But again, waiting to see when it lands. But that too, no doubt, will make recommendations around product standards, testing, certification and approach. And BSI stands ready with our expert committees to decide where, what needs to be done, how best that could be taken forward. Um, a number of us over the course of last year uh, spoke at a number of events all associated with building safety. And the general feeling was is that people who are close and, and, and very aligned with the professional institutions and similar are very much aware of, of the new building safety agenda. And in the case of the UK, a UK but more typically England, the Building Safety Act, and the changes made therein also to the, to the, the fire safety regulations for, for existing buildings, the regulatory reform fire safety order. But there were large swathes of, of audience that were completely blindsided as to what's coming into play by virtue of the, of the new act, and it is an act now, it's moved from bill stage and we have it as an act, and the effects it will have on the built environment and those that build buildings. There's a large body of people that think it will only ever touch high risk HRB buildings. It won't, it's gonna to touch everything. We have seen and started to see the movement of authority and responsibility for the building regulations in England from Deluc 
to the new building safety regulator set up under the auspices of the HSE. And that will include all aspects, including the approved documents and similar. But it will affect everybody that works within the industry. If you deal with building regulations, fire safety, yes, you don't have to build tall buildings to be affected. This is going to affect you. And therefore, there are discussions underway, perhaps, that we need some form of voluntary building safety consortia to ensure that we all work together and keep pushing forward in terms of the messaging and making, uh, making available appropriate information uh, and support to the industry. And then, of course, you know, from, from the point of view of health and safety, it's not just fire. Upcoming over the next few years, you're going to start seeing the, the second generation of the structural Euro codes. They're already cited in, in the approved documents that support national building regulations. But Gen 2 is coming, and therefore you'll start to see some messaging from ourselves around that and the work taking place at set level, which we actually lead. So we have both the chair and the secretariat, so that will be coming forward. And another aspect that perhaps doesn't always get sufficient coverage is the area of well-being and such areas such as accessibility. And so if you're not aware, but we published PAS 6463 last year, which is basically world-leading guidance on the design for the built environment to include the needs of people who experience sensory or neurological processing difference. So that could be people who might have dementia or be autistic. They engage with our environment very differently. And so this PAS, and there's a link later on, uh, we want to take that further and push it harder and ultimately expand uh, its content beyond the guidance it offers in terms of appropriate lighting and acoustics, decoration layout and wayfinding for the, to meet the needs of everybody in the built environment. So that will form a large part of, of some of our activity. Similarly, you might have seen the recommendations. It was certainly carried um, by a number of the professional institutions um, and the technicals at press. But last year, the Royal Academy of Engineering, at the request of uh, Patrick Balance, they worked with SIBSI and produced um, a, a report, Infection Resilient Environments, Time for a Major Upgrade. And this was all emanating from post-COVID and lessons learned. And they made a strong recommendation in there that BSI should work with industry and develop new standards to support greater health and well-being and indoor environments that better resist infection. And so you'll see some collateral coming out on that this year as well in terms of what next steps will look like that we continue to meet and discuss with the Royal Academy of Engineering of what that might look like. So for the year ahead, that's broadly uh, the activity in this space. Key stakeholders, well, everybody's key, aren't they? But yes, regulators are all important. And as I say, we continue to talk to our um, all, all regulators, in, including those um, around the UK. Yes, HSC, uh, all important. Those people working on uh, industry competence, the professional institutions, and those are Royal Academy. As Dan touched upon this and cross crossover here, we'll be at a number of events this year, so hopefully see you there as well. And there's some examples of some thought, sort of leadership and content we'll be putting out to support our stakeholders. So for us, it's all making available and ensuring discoverability of content and seeing what else is needed to react to the recommendations that follow this year. Some key standards that will come out, we're hoping uh, for 9191 code of practice, the fire safe design for residential buildings should be out as a, as a, as a new version. BS8629 evacuation alert systems uh, under the control of the fire brigade. BS7272 on actuation of uh, doors and in 1838 for emergency lighting. So an awful lot happening in the market. Next slide, please, and over to Ian. Yeah, thanks, Adam. And Hi everybody, good afternoon. Um, thanks for joining us today. One well, of the first things I want to say is appreciate how busy you all are, whether you're joining us live or on demand. So thanks for giving up some valuable time to listen to us just go through 2023. And as you can see from the slide that, that I'm talking through today, although it has quality as the theme profile, it's, it's much wider than that with a lot of activity around um, not just construction products, but also the plan of works and offsite as well. Um, the first one on there, around our objectives for this year on this topic uh, is to promote a, a new British standard, a, a pure BS standard, not an international or European one, BS slash um, PD 99001, 
which was a quality management systems specification for the application of, of ISO 9001 uh, in the built environment. So a, a, a sort of sector specific requirements standard that works alongside 9001. Obviously, the, the sort of background and purpose of this one, you've heard already from, from colleagues around um, the, the Grenfell inquiry, started the review of, of building regs and, and fire safety, conclusions around the wrong type of cladding, fire doors not properly installed and not to the correct specification and other problems of high rise buildings. But the conclusion of that was not just that it was a cladding issue, but a system that had fallen apart and wasn't fit for purpose. So the intention would, would be that this would, this would drive culture change and, and from Dame Judith Hackett's quote around putting quality at the heart of everything that is done in this sector and hence the reason why 99001 came about. So published towards the end of last year, I think it, for us it's about promoting the discovery of this, as you can see from the box on the right, and understanding what the benefits of using it. It's not meant to replace 9001, uh, it's working alongside it. But if you look at some of the collateral that's online, not just from BSI, but some of our industry colleagues as well, it's a really good webinar that Shirley Parsons did. If you go to their website and look at their, their on-demand um, webinars, you'll see one that mentions the Berlin Brandenburg Airport as a case study. Six billion euros spent on that and lots beset with problems. And a really interesting um, analysis of how potentially something like 99,001 could really help with some of the challenges that they faced. So that's what we're looking at this year, looking at things like helpful um, implementation text for people um, you know, how is it going to work with certification? A new management system standard is always a challenge, but that's what we can work on for that one. And then an extension of that is around the Construction Innovation Hub's CPQP, Construction Product Quality Planning. Um, obviously, that aim is to ensure the quality is built into the manufacturing process um, and the final product from the start and any new products meet performance requirements from day one and throughout the life cycle. So that's aligned with 99001 and will help manufacturers and duty holders comply with the Building Safety Act um, when presenting a building safety case to regulators. So you can see that perhaps some, some pilots and some case studies again for both 99001 and CPQP will be really powerful. Uh, the next one on there is, is working with REBA on the, the plan of works, um, definitive model for the design and construction process of buildings, which organizes the process of briefing, designing, constructing and operating building projects into eight stages, as I'm sure you're all well aware. But as you can imagine, this brings in a wealth of standards to underpin these processes. So we've begun um, early conversations with Reba on working on an overlay to the plan of works for standards. And this overlay will outline the most relevant standards to support those who use the plan of works as part of the services they offer, such as designers and engineers. Quite a big one on there, as you can imagine, is um, providing leadership and supporting HMG for UK CA marking. Now, you probably could do an hour alone on this topic, hence the reason why a lot of the thought leadership content and the events will, will cover construction products and hopefully begin to, to clear the fog a little bit with, with where we're at with this. So we obviously had legislation going way back to 29 and then came into effect, 2019, that came into effect a couple of years later to make it, uh, arrangements for the regulation of construction products after EU exit. Um, a slightly, of course, challenge, challenging is an understatement that the end of the recognition of the CE mark for construction products has been extended to the 30th of June. So this postponement, I think, is intended to allow business time to prepare for the introduction of the new UK CA mark. But obviously, when we're working with, with, um, with government about how standards work and transposing what is around 440 designated standards um, from the from the old EU harmonized standard model. It's incredibly complex. So we're working very closely with those key stakeholders. Again, as Anne says, quite obvious who they may well be. Um, and then, of course, there's a revision of European construction products regulation. What will that revised CPR mean for construction products? Quite heavily leaning towards sustainability, um, proposed regulation, manufacturers have to deliver environmental information about the life cycle of their products, which means compliance with several obligations, one of which is to design and manufacture a product and packaging in such a way that the overall environmental sustainability reaches the state-of-the-art level, if I can quote 
them for a moment. But then achieving this whilst not compromising on quality or safety is one of the key aspects, especially in the terms of consistency and overlap with, within European standards. So this is clearly something we'll be keeping an eye on this year and trying to help um, with that compliance aspect and any potential confusion that may come across industry. Um, we've got some offside, the last bullet point there, offside construction solutions. So my colleague Claire Price, who you will hear from next. Um, development started last week, hot off the press, of PAS 8700, MMC for residential buildings, specification and guidance. Um, and publication of this, this document is expected next year. There is a new technical committee, CB301, to develop a pipeline of national standards and um, the, the, the business case for a British standard on terminology is ex expected this year. CB301 is also mirroring an ISO committee for prefabricated building standards and there's a second meeting of that committee in 2023. So probably Anne, in the interest of, of time and with Claire coming next and then hopefully some questions, I'll draw a line under that one there and hand over to Claire. Thank you Ian. Next slide please. Thanks. <clears throat> Thank you, Ian and and Ant. And uh, uh, yes, good afternoon, everyone. Um, okay, so I'm going to be focusing on uh, sustainability, sustainable construction, um, briefly today. Just wanting to highlight these three broad areas that we're going to be focused on uh, this year um, and going forward, really. Um, so um, and then talking about really what's going to be uh, delivered what we're planning on focusing on and how you can get involved as well so i'll start with the energy efficiency retrofit work that we're doing uh past 2035 2030 domestic retrofit standards are pretty well established now uh, first published in 2019 um, we had an amendment last year. There is another revision due this year. We are going on to an annual review cycle for those standards because um, there is a lot of uh, changes coming up. There's a need to ad adopt um, uh, innovative measures. Um, we're learning as we go in this area as more and more people take up these standards and we start rolling out more retrofit. So um, we are due uh, public consultation for the 2023 version in the spring and then late spring we will be publishing uh, that version. We're also going to be delivering a white paper as well just to, to help to clarify um, some aspects of that standard, uh, some of the terminology used in that, some of the misconceptions um, uh, around that area. Uh, so do look out for that as well. Past 2038, which is our um, uh, energy efficiency retrofit standard for non-domestic buildings, uh, it was published in 2021. We are due a review of that. So we do welcome any feedback on anyone who might have used that standard, uh, uh, how well it was received. We want to know that, how easy it was to use, etc. So we are keen to hear um, about, uh, about that uh, document and some of the strengths and some of the weaknesses so that we can decide whether to um, uh, make some changes uh, to that. I mean, I've, I've, I've included something meeting the challenge uh, because it is um, a really important area. There is a high level of interest around rolling out energy efficiency retrofit, especially on the domestic side. Um, Eco Plus is something that the government is, is looking to roll out. They consulted on it just before Christmas. And there really is a strong drive to try and um, increase uh, the number of retrofits that take place. And of course, the standards focus very much on assessment and on design and on avoiding risk uh, risks around bad retrofit. Um, so there is a bit of a dynamic there. Um, which, which we're having to address all the time. And of course, it, has, it, it, it does uh, call up some new roles um, in the industry, uh, retrofit coordinator role, retrofit assessor. And um, this connects with a lot of the competence work under the Building Safety Act. Actually, we're starting to have the conversations about what competence in these, these new areas really looks like. Um, to ensure that that can go forward in a, in a better way. 
And we're always talking to uh, the retrofit industry, the installer community, and of course, the, the, the key government um, departments that are focused on this area. Moving on to infrastructure, um, in particular, low carbon, uh, net zero considerations, <clears throat> past 2018, again, a pre-existing standard that was published in 2016, carbon management in infrastructure, the first standard of its kind um, anywhere in the world. Uh, it's been very well received. Uh, we started to revise it last year, and that is the new edition is due out in April, along with the guidance that accompanies that, which is published by the ICE, not published by us. Um, but the work obviously is done together by the same group of people. Um, past 2080 is, is uh, 2023 is going to be for buildings and infrastructure. So it's actually expanding its content uh, alongside including uh, nature-based solutions as well. Um, we are launching uh, the new edition on April the 5th, that'll be an online event, um, uh, so, so do look out, out for that and, and join us for that event. And the ICE will be having a follow-up event on the 18th of April as well, uh, talking through case studies and, and so on. And in fact there was um, a webinar uh, last week, the 26th of January, um, which was looking at contract requirements, the NEC contract uh, clause X29 um, around climate change and how how PAS 2080 can can work with that. So so I believe that's available on demand. So so do go online and have a look for that if you're interested in that area. Low carbon concrete and low carbon materials in general is obviously a, a huge area in terms of um, the impacts uh, it can it can actually contribute towards net zero. Um, we have got uh, a new uh, project around low carbon concrete. Uh, you may be aware of the uh, ICE's uh, low carbon concrete route map that was published last year, which we were involved with. One of the recommendations, one of their recommendations was around a new standard. So, so that's what we're doing. It's a new flex project which will enable us to have a it's a it's an iterative approach. So there will be two or three versions of uh, the standard looking at um, specifying low carbon concrete. And in the longer term, we will be planning to convert that flex project to um, a new version of PAS 8500 part three for that. Uh, so um, that work will be starting um, in probably Q2 uh, this year. Uh, green steel um, is, is a little newer for us. There was a lot of interest around COP27 and our director of standards was, was looking at this area and discussing green steel. I think at an international level, there's a huge amount of interest and we are having discussions with the UN uh, on that subject. Um, and engagement wise, yes, we continue to engage uh, very strongly with the Green Construction Board Infrastructure Working Group, who, who are really leading on PAS 2080 um, and on the low carbon concrete, as a matter of fact. And we've been also engaging a lot more with the digital side and, and obviously um, connecting with Dan Rossiter and some of his contacts uh, around how um, the digital and BIM community can really connect with PAS 2080 and what it means for them. Um, so moving on to the last column, um, the Environment Act, which, which came out in November 2021, I, I mean, I think that there is going to be some very large impacts on the built environment industry. I know that a lot of its targets are focused around 2030 to 2042, um, but I think that it is important for us to really look at that, and I'm planning on, on doing that this year. So I'm very keen to engage with industry on the likely impacts uh, from um, the target setting under the Environment Act. And I will be uh, talking to 
colleagues internally as well uh, in our sustainability team and government contacts and local authorities as well. And just on that area, uh, BS8895, uh, which is our material efficiency standard or designing out waste standard, is going to be published this year. So that's one to look out for as well. And I think that's it from me. So hopefully um, there's not too much more before we have time for some questions. Thanks a lot. Absolutely. Thank you, Claire. Next slide, please. Yeah, just very quickly as a gentle reminder that we are going to continue our webinar series in 2023 on a near monthly basis. Um, and wherever possible, we will either utilise those dates to update you on some new and revised key standards that we think you might wish to be aware of, or we'll blend them with full leisure pieces as well as to other items that we would wish to cover and appraise you of. Some examples of some upcoming ones. Um, just trying to look on the dates for this, but building upon what we've done here for the sector team activity, our committee team are wanted to come and present on how we organise our built environment committees and how you can get more closely involved, either in terms of joining committees or just contributing uh, to public consultations on the standards or recommending new standards that might be needed. We'll look at 2080, carbon management, as, as Claire's touched on there, retrofit, modern methods of construction and competency too. We also have a bi-monthly webinar series with the Institution of Fire Engineers, and that's going to start next month. And the first one of those will be uh, Planning Gateway 1, where we'll be joined by our new building safety regulator from the HSC that oversees that process. Next slide, please. And on that basis, I suggest we've got a meaningful amount of time to have some Q&A. So if colleagues could kindly turn their cameras on, and I can apportion some questions to you all, so thank you. Good to see you properly. All right, so we do, as I say, I've got a number of questions that came in prior, um, and I've got a, a, a good feel of questions coming in too. But if we just sort of take them in rough sectoral order, and then there's some broad ones I want to cover off to as time allows. So essentially one for Dan, I'd suggest. Dan, how will BSI help major projects practically benefit of interfacing ISO 19650 and the ISO 9000 family? All right, thank you. Ed. Um, I mean, there are a number of different ways, and I think uh, probably the easiest point is that um, the work we're doing with NEMA around the resources that support the UK BIM framework. So the idea being that there's a wealth of guidance uh, and webinar bits that have been created by those in industry uh, who are interested in so ensuring the practical applications of these standards and there's an awful lot of really good content that's gone into that to support it where people have added practical examples they've given their own insights and added those extra bits there so i think if you're working on these major projects and want to see actually what are some of the benefits of doing it it's looking at that guidance and seeing some of the videos and content that comes out of NEMA and the wider UK BIM framework in that way to support it and, and see those answers there. Brilliant. Thank you, Dan. Thank you. Um, an awful lot of questions around sustainability and similar. Um, so perhaps one for you, Claire, if I may. Um, what is the single biggest improvement that can help achieve net zero, but is deliverable in the next 24 months? Any thoughts, please? Uh, yeah, I, I, I like that question. Uh, <laughs> thank you. Um, I think um, for me, that, so, so we have we have this sort of domestic retrofit challenge before us, um, and uh, and everybody talks about the measures and how you know we just need to keep insulating or we need to uh, roll out heat pumps, um, uh, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. I, I really do think that um, the biggest the, the the best thing we can do is to carry out um, as much uh, retrofit assessments as we possibly can and um, retrofit medium term plans which are in the standard as well and a design because the really important thing is um, what's going to be good for these individual properties um, and 
what that activity would generate would be a pipeline of activity. We'd have a real sense of, of whole community areas where, yes, it is about insulation or it's a combination of insulation and, and new heating systems, etc. It's that front end of the process uh, which is really important um, and it's the whole house assessment, it's the whole house design and then you roll out the individual measures and I think that that would really have the biggest impact in the, in the quickest space of time, shortest space of time. And Claire, I suppose as a follow-up to that, I mean obviously with our RSTG uh, sort of a committee and similar, are those sorts of comments going back to government in, in the way of broad recommendations and suggestions? Yes, I mean, certainly our retrofit standards task group um, are keen to get that message across. And part of the white paper that um, uh, I mentioned earlier was to try and clarify some of these aspects, because a lot of people think whole house retrofit means you have to install all these measures all in one go. But actually, the standard defines whole house retrofit as a whole house assessment. You look at everything that, that is there in the house, its age, what's already there, what's going to be the most benefit, how to balance the positives and the negatives and avoid the risks of that particular whole house. And then you roll out in stages. So that is the message that we're, we're sending. Yeah. Brilliant. Thank you, Claire. Uh, again, loads of messages there in, in relation to <laughs> designated standards, Ian. So one for you. Um, how do you foresee the whole issue of designated standards working? especially if the regulator decides that they want additional requirements from construction products. Yeah, as you say, I'm not surprised that one gets pulled down. We, we genuinely don't have time to cover it in enough detail, which is why I think when we set our landscape for the year, it's something that we really have to invest an enormous amount of time to explore. But, you know, I think if I, if I knew the answer to it properly, I'd probably get a knighthood. But um, I think, as you say, it's ultimately, for the regulator to decide how this is going to work we have the the, the conversations we've already had some really rich conversations with bays and ops around um, the 440 construction products designated standards that exist at the moment I, I think i read something not that long ago where it said there hadn't actually been any uh, harmonized standards put into the official journal for some time and it does make you wonder what would happen if that sort of unstuck itself and, and then it's not necessarily BSI that, that um, makes decisions on, on standards being designated or, or even de-designated. That is where we have to have this process that needs to be designed that doesn't exist at the moment to say how would um, HMG decide what needs to be, you know, how would we then fulfil that? And then, as you said in your presentation in, in your slide earlier, and with safety critical products, it's exactly the same. You would like to think if we felt like there was something different for the UK market, we could go into the European Technical Committee model and propose those changes. But, you know, we just don't know if we'd be successful in that endeavour. So then what do you do about meeting the needs of the UK market? Is that going to need some sort of wraparound one day that we would we would add in? So I think ultimately the message is, you know, it's not just the sector that needs to innovate. It's also our standards development model that's going to need to innovate. And we, we can't just rely on the existing model. We're, we're just learning to cope with an unprecedented situation, I think. But that's probably an ongoing conversation for some time, I suspect. Oh, absolutely. Thank you. Uh, we've got many more questions, and I'm mindful of the time. But one has just come in from a name I recognise. Jeremy, you know who you are. Uh, why are so many of the new construction sector standards developed as PASs? flexes, etc., rather than the regular regular British standards? Is it just a speed thing? Anybody got a really speedy answer? Otherwise, I'm happy to say. We're innovating. Absolutely. OK, I mean, from our perspective, yes, we do talk about uh, the benefits of flex and pass for speed. I mean, they, are, they do get the profile. However, please be assured that work continues on the formal uh, standards regime and again if you have a look at the website you can see what continues to come through in terms of new standards but also the amendments and updated of, of our old standards such as you know some of our core standards i'm afraid we haven't got any more time huge thank you to my team my colleagues for, for what you've done today so i suggest we'll just start to, to finish down and, and just move on to the next slide please
thank you. Uh, from, uh, we've spoken about a number of items today. You will get a copy of this slide deck. So all we've drawn together there are some of the some of the links therein where you can hook into some of these standards of which we've touched upon all the approaches, where you can download a, a number of those at free at points of download, including um, such as the uh, 6463 standard we touched upon for neurodiver neurodiversity. Next slide, please. This is again all about outreach and similar. So when you, you get our slides, don't worry about trying to get a shot of that. You will have our contact points therein. And as I say, if you've got some questions, you want to chat, please do reach out to us. Uh, we find such engagement really useful and incitement. And then just final last slide, please. A general reminder that the next uh, event we've got is the 28th of February. That's when the Building Safety Regulator is joining us to talk about planning gateway one. And that we in partnership with the IFE. And so the only other point I wish to say is say thank you. Thank you for you for making time to join us today. I know you're all very, very busy individuals. Thank you to the team for their sterling work on the presentations today and all that they do. And thank you too to our colleagues on the event side who make this happen. Uh, we really appreciate it. I hope you found it really useful. Hope to see you all again soon. Thank you. Thanks, Thanks. Bye. Bye.